Hello, this is Wednesday, the 26th of January um, uh, 2022. Welcome to IQI or Inconvenient Questions International. I'm your host, Vishwa Sadashivan from Singapore. IQ is committed to fostering deeper understanding, empathy, and involvement through meaningful, informed conversations across boundaries. Awareness, we believe, is the first step towards action. Today, we are here to discuss the topic, 2022, is it a year of hope? Now, before that, in keeping with the tradition of IQI, let me provide some context to this discussion. Perhaps a quick recap of what we experienced in the past two years. I would like to present it in three broad schemes or themes. It goes without saying that the COVID-19 pandemic remains perhaps the single most significant event at a global level since the Second World War. It's had the power to alter the course of history and the way we live, the way we interact. Second, we are witnessing what is possibly the most formidable challenge to capitalist democracy, at least as we know it. China together with Russia and other South countries are questioning if democracy and the freedoms that it celebrates are really serving the people and indeed the greater good. Perhaps more significantly, questions have arisen if the USA is indeed the preeminent player in the world, not just the free world. The third theme is the innovation of radically different ways of how we live, how we work and play. Living with the pandemic endemically, the hybrid work model and the metaverse lead the charge in this area. So first, the COVID-19 pandemic. It has plagued the world in the past two years and the World Health Organization or WHO officially declared the pandemic on the 1st of March, 2020. Just when things appeared to be getting under control, the Delta variant hit us in mid 2021, last year. Now we are confronted by the Omicron variant. It's been a global tango of sorts, two steps forward and five steps back. Now, more than 5 million people around the world have died so far. This, I believe, is a conservative estimate. This, even with more than 7.5 million vaccine doses administered in 184 countries in the first 11 months of 2011. Now, that being said, we are seeing several world economies jump-starting and appearing to be on a path to recovery. The question remains, will this lead to a truly post-COVID world in 2022? Could the changes we witness cause a return to the type of slow growth experienced after the 2008 global financial crisis? Is the current high inflation here to stay? Or are we at the cusp of a braver, exciting new world having emerged stronger from COVID, from the COVID experience. Now, what are some of the big picture structural changes we are likely to see in 2022? The pandemic has certainly brought into sharp relief and, and I would say uh, in a thought provoking way, the disparity between the haves and have nots. Even with donations and further pledges by the US, China and Europe, 42 low and middle income countries representing no less than 1.1 billion people have only enough to fully vaccinate 10% of their population. Now, this brings us to the second theme, the challenge to capitalist democracy. The general expectation is a widening of the divide between the North and South, between the haves and the have nots and between the East and West, so to speak, a bifurcation. US and European foreign aid is increasingly likely to have a countering China agenda. Now, this includes the G7's recent partnership to, quote, build back better world, or B3W. Now, likewise, there's been growing power rivalry in technology areas such as 5G, FinTech, uh, social media, and of course, cryptocurrency. The US and Europe will continue to highlight human rights violations 
by China and Russia. For example, China's mistreatment of the Muslim Uyghurs in the Xinjiang province. Likewise, we can expect repeated criticism of China's transgression of the rule of law in the South China Sea and its alleged exploitation in Africa and some countries in South Asia. China and Russia and others, on the other hand, will increasingly point to the dysfunctionalities of democracies. Put bluntly, the heavy price to pay for unabated freedoms, studies show that in terms of global wealth distribution, the poorest 50% own just 2% of total wealth, while the richest 10% own 76% of global wealth. Even in terms of carbon emissions, there appears to be a disparity between the haves and have nots and between the West and the rest. In the USA, the bottom 50%, 50 50% of the population emits 10 tons of carbon, while East Asia emits three tons. The numbers are even more telling when you look at emission figures of the top 10%. East Asia, 39 tons, and for the USA, it's a whopping 73 tons. Now, we can expect aggressive lobbying by the US and China in 2022. More countries will be under pressure to choose. As they say, you're with me or against me. The third big theme is about exciting possibilities that are emerging thanks to the human spirit that refuses to be cowed by adversity. We are seeing in the present what the future of work is going to be. Flexible work arrangements is the order of the day, thanks to COVID-19 and a general push for choices. A PwC survey in August of 2021 showed US employees wanting to work remotely part or all of the week as they juggle work, home lives, caregiving responsibilities, and mental stability. Employers, on the other hand, show a preference for work in person, at least for some of the time. Also, there's this great resignation, you may have heard of it, where more people are quitting their jobs and reprioritizing their lives. There appears to be a growing preference for the gig economy. Now, social media is increasingly at the center of human existence. The COVID pandemic has increased the reliance on it, the comfort in using it, and the level of trust. It has become the default means for governments to inform, educate, and even entertain the public as well as galvanize them. I'm certain this provided the impetus for the metaverse. Mark Zuckerberg, founder and CEO of, of Facebook, even announced a brand name change to Meta, M-E-T-A. Microsoft is the other big player in the space, which is also backed by major brands such as Nike, Gucci, and Prada. Essentially, the idea is to enable users to interact, socialize, and create content in the virtual environment and, man and, and, and subsequently monetize transactions using blockchain technology and cryptocurrency. Now, also known as 3Web, the metaverse is intrinsically linked to non-fungible tokens or NFTs that enable the creation and selling of digital art art artifacts. The expressed idea or ideal of all these developments in the cyber world with the use of blockchain, cryptocurrency and tokens is financial inclusivity. They are designed to democratize access to, the opportu to opportunities by allowing investors of all sizes to engage in a wide range of assets in the real or cyber world. It is about giving life to the adage, you can be and do whatever you want. It's this same zeal that has propelled the likes of Elon Musk, Richard Branson, and Jeff Bezos to enter a space where only governments played. They have launched private space companies, SpaceX, Virgin Galactic, and Blue Origin. They are planning on launching thousands of low orbit satellites into the atmosphere this year, 2022. The mission is to bring fast, reliable broadband internet at a reasonable price to every corner of the world to democratize access. How exciting. Yes, but most unfortunately, there is a big downside. With so many things connected, the internet of things, metaverse, cryptocurrency and tokenization, we can and must expect 
an exponential increase in cyber attacks. There will be a dramatic rise in hacking, phishing, and even complete takeover of computer systems. Now, all this simply means that governments have to work a lot closer with the private sector and the people sector. For this, there has to be a genuine willingness to share, consult, and listen. There has to be trust. There has to be a deep desire to move from zero sum to win-win, from competition to collaboration, from seeing each other as the enemy to working together against a common threat. I would like to, personally, I'd like to see what we're going through now as a timely opportunity, you know, as, as Richard mentioned, it's, it's an opportunity to enhance our strengths, to reconnect, to realize the importance of reconnecting with fellow human beings, not just within our own country, within our own culture, within our own religion, language, to realize that we, we actually are meant to be connected across boundaries because when a common problem like this happens, we need to find a common solution. You know, and we need to find some way to work together. Um, so, so we need to find a way to enhance our strengths and to acknowledge and mitigate our weaknesses. So what we have is a gift. Let's use it well. And hope and hope and hope is what gives us the wherewithal to manage this turmoil, this uncertainty. Now, President Barack Obama put it most aptly, and I'd like to quote him. Hope in the face of difficulty. Hope in the face of uncertainty. The audacity of hope, in the end, that is God's great, greatest gift to us. A belief in things not seen. A belief that there are better days ahead. This was Inconvenient Questions, where ideas awaken. <laughs>